Hi, this is Rob Hawley from the Fremont Peak Observatory. Since publishing my original lecture about six months ago, a number of questions have come up. This video will attempt to pass along those answers to all. But first to reiterate the premise of the entire series. An eclipse is a unique experience. Don't waste the eclipse by spending your time futzing with your camera. Experience it. Here are a number of topics that have come up. Let me provide answers to those and in some cases amend what I've told you previously. I provided some guidance in the videos from my own experience taking photos in the past. However, I did not try to cover all circumstances. For a more complete list of what exposures will capture what phenomena, I suggest you go back to the original source, and that's Espinac's work cited here. I'm a great fan of recording the experience of an eclipse using wide-angle video cameras. However, I've never seen video cameras attached to a telephoto do a very good job about recording an eclipse. There are a couple problems. First is poor focus or poor resolution or operating beyond the limits of the zoom. In any event, what you end up with is something that's not really sharp. The second is the camera will need manual adjustments and that's going to detract from the eclipse experience. The last is that you're going to probably be spending your time looking at a little screen which is going to be recording what your video camera sees instead of looking at the sky and viewing the eclipse. That's not what this series is intended to try to get you to do. In my videos, I mentioned that I use a special astronomical camera with a modified filter. A number of people have asked me if this is a requirement, and the answer is, well, it's not, but understand the trade-off. The prominences and the chromosphere glow with hydrogen gas, and hydrogen emits at very specific frequencies, as shown in this picture. A conventional camera will partially filter the deep red hydrogen alpha. That will mean that the resulting image will contain more blue and green as compared to the image that I will take where the H alpha is not filtered. And so the hydrogen will end up looking kind of pinkish. Not bad, but that's the trade-off. DSLRs can only take pictures so fast. If you try to take too many pictures in too short a time, you fill up the queue being written and it will stop taking pictures. This happened to me in 2010. If you take a look at my video on Bailey's Beach, you will notice gaps in the times. That's when the camera stalled. I was asked a question on how fast you can take pictures, and I got the answer wrong, so let me correct it now. Under computer control, you're using USB to control the camera. With USB control, I find that with the cameras I've been using, I can take a picture about every three seconds. What I got wrong is if you trigger the camera using the external trigger, like for example my automated shutter release, then you can take a picture about every second. During Easter Island I forgot my programmable shutter release. Trying to trigger the camera manually, I pushed the button too fast and filled up the queue, consequently losing pictures. Had I used my automated shutter release, I'd have gotten nice, regular, once a second images. Next to worrying about getting stuck in traffic on eclipse day, my next biggest worry is a sun with no sunspots and how do I focus? I was asked during some of my presentations, well, can you just focus on a hill? And I never tried it, so I wasn't sure. So I did an experiment. I set my telescope up about a mile from a hill that has a bunch of antennas with very fine detail, including wires leading from them. A perfect focus target. I adjusted my telescope to make these perfectly in focus. I then put on my solar filter and swung the telescope towards the sun. As you can see, the focus is pretty much perfect. Let's zoom into full frame. Two little tiny sunspots. While these don't look perfectly crisp, this is about what you'd expect. Make sure you pick a target far away. My target was about a mile, and I wouldn't try anything much closer than that. Otherwise, you're not going to get a true infinity. The next questions refer to tracking. For the first couple eclipses I did, I tried manually tracking. And boy, let me tell you, it did not meet KISS. Thus, for eclipses on land, I haven't tried to manually adjust a camera for more than 10 years. The question that I keep getting asked is, do you really need a tracking mount, or can you take the pictures just from a tripod? So I decided to perform an experiment. For this experiment, I'm using my standard optics on an equatorial mount, but with the tracking off. In theory, I aligned the camera to where the sun should move, but it turns out I got it wrong. I've taken the liberty of photoshopping in an HDR image of an eclipse. 
to show you how the framing will be affected by the sun's movement. The interesting stuff in Eclipse starts about two minutes before the eclipse. Again, if you take the premise of my videos, watching this stuff is going to be your highest priority. So we're going to start with the camera aligned with the sun a little off center about two minutes before totality. If you're following my recommendations, you've replaced your solar filter with a hat and you're now spending your time looking at the oncoming eclipse. You've lost the ability to look through your viewfinder until C2 actually happens. However, you can still make adjustments using your soul searcher. And after filters off, you can use a screen on your camera. It's now C2. Look how much the sun has moved. You're now cropping the corona. Maximum eclipse, the sun is continuing to march towards the edge of your screen. C3, totality is coming to an end. And again, the sun is close to the edge of the field of view. So what's my conclusion from this? With my optics, manual adjustment will be required continuously during totality to keep the sun centered. To have any chance at all means you'll need a gear head, and preferably a gear head tilted at your latitude so that a single adjustment will track the sun. The whole reason I've taken tracking mounts to places as distant as Svalbard and Easter Island was that I wanted to experience the eclipse and not chase the sun. Predictions are that Eclipse Day will see almost unprecedented traffic across the entire band of the U.S. Major cities such as Portland, Denver, Memphis, and Atlanta are just outside the eclipse track. A little further are the cities of California, Seattle, Chicago, Washington, D.C. Spurred by local media coverage, many from these areas will be converging on a narrow band of land. It will be important for you to leave early and to have a plan at your destination that corresponds to local circumstances. I've done the most research about the Oregon area, so let me share what I've got so far. In Salem, Oregon, which will likely be a target of California and Portland, there are a number of events happening. I will let you explore them with using Google, but I wouldn't go up there unless you knew where you were going. The other area likely to be a destination for California and Portland is Madras, on the east side of the Cascades. Madras has a specific planned event going, and everyone going to Madras needs to get tickets, or they will likely not be able to park in, your, in the city. For more information, see the website listed here. Throughout this series, I've emphasized safety, and I want to close by re-emphasizing it here. Looking at the sun is dangerous. However, if you follow the advice I've given in the series, this will be a safe and rewarding experience for you. If you have further questions, please feel free to submit them either as YouTube comments or by email to eclipse at fpoa.net.